Welcome to Mako's workshop on stroke and coat glazes. Here are the supplies that you will need to glaze along with us as we discuss all the properties of stroke and coat glaze. You will also need three patterns, and all of this information will be found on Mako's website, makocolors.com. Go to the project library, and then look for stroke and coat bird. Download your pattern. In the project library, you'll notice that there are two options. You choose which one you want, but in this class, we're doing the blue. All right, so get your item out that you're going to be glazing. Take your damp sponge, wipe it off. Now, with stroke and coat, it is thicker. And I was telling some of the, the Duncan people that are, are kind of converting and using stroke and coat more, it is thicker. The viscosity of stroke and coat is a little thicker than pretty much all of those on the market, which is why you can get opacity with three coats. You don't have to do four and five coats. It's going to work. So yeah, let's get some of the cotton tail. We're gonna base coat our plate. And because base coating does take some dry time, if you guys have a fan handy, you're gonna to wanna to use that to help uh, speed up the dry time. Mako never recommends using heat. So no hair dryers, no putting it under heat lamps or anything like that. Because you want to dry it to dry from the inside out, as opposed to getting the skin to dry, unless we're doing a specific technique. All right, so I've got this wet, stripped the water out with my fingers, just primed it to get it ready so that it's not going to absorb all the glaze. You're going to load your brush, and you guys can even just right there feel how creamy and thick that is. You want more is more. You want a fully loaded brush. Don't worry about the ferrules because after the session, we'll clean it out and get that glaze out of there. If you leave the glaze in there, that's when your bristles start splitting and do a lousy job. So load that brush full and we're gonna do a nice long brush strokes. You're gonna notice that you'll need to refill fairly often because of the fact that it is thicker it doesn't glide on or flow like foundations, which was formulated for base coating large areas. All of these glazes we're using today are going to be a glossy finish when fired. They're also frit based. Stroke and coat is a frit based glaze so that when we get this completely encapsulated with glaze, so we're doing three coats of white on the front and then three coats of black on the back. And actually on the back of it, you can pick any color you want because it's your artwork. But since we have three coats front and back on this plate, we have completely encapsulated the earthenware bisque, which is porous. We do not need to put clear glaze on it. Look at that glossy shine just with the glaze itself, okay? I love that. All right, so continue base coating. We're only going to work on the front of this plate today while I'm here because when uh, we do teaching, this is how I call seminar teaching because I want this to dry quicker. We don't glaze the back of it as well because then that encapsulates all the moisture and it takes longer to dry. Since we're going to be using clay carbon paper to trace on our pattern, I want this glaze nice and dry because clay carbon paper doesn't transfer very well or at all actually on a damp bisque, damp glaze, all right? If you hear that brush dragging, you don't have enough glaze on here. I'm trying to get it to do it. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I have a hair, a bristle in there. I'm just going to leave that. I'm going to cause more damage gouging trying to get that out. I'll just let it burn off in the firing and stroke and coat levels out just in, enough where you're fine. Can you guys hear? Uh, you probably can't hear that. Anyway, when it does that, it's dragging. <clears throat> okay, so Mako's rule of thumb is you let the shine go away and then apply the next coat. 
And the reason we do that instead of being bone dry is so that there's a little bit of tooth for each coat to grab the next layer of glaze. So we don't want this totally bone dry. We just want the shine off of this. And because the first coat on the earthenware, it soaks in pretty fast. So we're not gonna have to wait very long. Now Robin is asking, can a stroke and coat be used on clay that has not been bisque fired? And uh, the answer is yes. I believe Krista answered this on the chat, but I'm just gonna tell you all the answer is yes, you can. You can um, hand build, but our rule of thumb is if it is a functional piece, a bowl, a mug, or a plate, we prefer that you bisque fire that cl uh, clay and then paint it. If it's a decorative piece, just make sure that you leave the bottom of the piece. Pretend this is a, a vessel you just made. Don't glaze the bottom so that they'll be out gassing. And you can, let's say it's a pencil holder, you know, you can glaze everything else, leave the bottom unglazed, dry foot that, and you can do a one time firing. A lot of school teachers do that because they uh, are short on you know, hours that they can work with the kids and trying to get something done. So food products, you want a bisque fire, decorative pieces, you can get away with a one-time firing with stroke and coat on clay or greenware. All right, so I'd say at least 90% of mine is dry. You guys can see that there's a little gloss here and there. Not enough for me to sit around and twiddle my thumbs and check my Instagram and all that. So I'm gonna load my, my brush up nice and full again. More is more. I'm gonna lay down a coat. The key is you want long flowing coats. Don't let your students do this number. When you do those short little choppy strokes, you actually wind up taking off more than you're putting down. And we want to lay down a nice smooth coat of glaze so that we have a nice smooth background. Okay, if you put a really lumpy, bumpy, sparse, uneven background, it's gonna fire out that way. There's not that ma much magic in the kiln. All right, so loading this bad boy up, getting my second coat on here. Okay, my Duncan people, or those of you that have never used stroke and coat before, you can unmute mute yourself and what are you guys thinking on this? It's a little different, I would think. Oh, Ronald has a good point and I was kind of doing it without saying it, follow the form of your piece. I was doing that, but that's a good point. When you're loading it, I was going with the form, going around and kind of following the direction. But you notice also, I didn't cross hatch. You do not need to do that with stroke and coat. You can just lay it down in one direction. Anybody have any comments? Beautifully done, Teddy. Oh, thank you, Mama. You're welcome. <laughs> the quiet in here. Yeah. Um, Typically, I use foundations glaze for base coating more than I do stroke and coat, but you will run into, we don't have all the same colors and foundations as we do in stroke and coat. So sometimes you may need to use stroke and coat to complete the design that you wanted. Foundations glaze, and we did have a seminar on that. There is the video on YouTube if you want to go back and do that, because it goes through the three different uh, fired surface, uh, fired finishes with foundations. But since this is a stroke and coat workshop, we want to show you that you can base coat with it. It does have a completely different feel to foundations, but it does the same thing. It's going to fire glossy. It is going to be dinnerware safe. You're going, you can skip the clear glaze with proper encapsulation of the bisque. That's okay. um, uh, you had mentioned about how these can be used, they're gonna be glossy. Did you mm -hmm. touch on the fact that why we call them Wonder Glaze? Or were you gonna do that? 
Yeah, the, I don't know if you guys ever noticed that, but underneath there's the tag tagline, the Wonder Glaze. Because when this was developed, actually this was kind of developed in the response to the paint your own pottery industry coming along and people wanting to know what their color is going to look like when they fire it. So I don't know about you guys, but when I was in high school, all the glazes had the iron oxide look. You never knew for sure what it was going to look like until it was fired. So now with these colors, when you look at the bottle, you know that it's going to fire very similar to this. The wonder glaze about this is it does it all. If you basically only want to carry one glaze, want to put your money into one glaze line and not do a lot of different products, this is the one to do. Because you can base coat, because of the design work to it, it is a non-moving, fairly stiff glaze. So that's how you can get beautiful designs on vertical surfaces and if you have an image on that Krista you can pop in anytime while I'm talking and show that where it's something that we have on a maybe a vase that has a beautiful design work. Um, stroke and coat can be thinned down for watercolor and then you would definitely want to use a clear glaze. You can uh, fire this from earthenware which we're working on today to mid-range you can put it on stoneware and it works and we're going to show you that in a little bit. If for if you're going to use it on stoneware look at the label and it'll say special notes mid-range color results. This one slightly lightens but the dots remain the same so speckled blue yonder is going to lighten a little bit but I'll still have my nice little white dots in there. Um, no change on my cottontail. So stroke and coat does it all. You can sponge with it. You can do the bubble technique. You can, um, like I said, watercolor. It can go on clay or greenware. It just has a wide range of performance on what it'll do. Um, we have the rubber stamps that we stamp with it. We use it for silk screening. You know, it just does it all. And hence the Wonder Glaze. I feel like I should have a little bottle with a cape on it and it comes flying through. Yeah, um, and oh, Ronald, thank you. You can uh, mix these also, they're intermixable. So that you, oh, that sets pretty. There you go. So Krista's popping up an image here that look at the design work on this and how it stays in place. You're not gonna have it um, moving on you once it's applied on a vertical surface. I don't think I've seen that one, that's kind of fun. Oh, Carmen Allen, one of our in-house designers. Let's see, somebody asked if there was a clear glaze on the uh, picture that I showed and it was not clear glaze. It had foundations as a base and then it had, um, actually it has um, stroke and coat on just on top of the foundations and there was no clear glaze on it. Okay. All right, how are you guys doing on this? Mine, you can only see a few shiny areas so let's go ahead, if you guys are in that same air, um, position, go, let's get our third coat on here. Okay, so if, when you go to our website and you go over here to resources, you are gonna scroll down to product conversions. And I've already clicked on that and this is where we ended up. When you scroll down, this will show stroke and coat and foundations conversion. It shows all different conversions from other companies to Mako. So if we click on here, this will show you the foundations and the stroke and coat combination there, or the, the ones that match. So that way you can use that as a base color or whatever situation you're looking for. Some of them are a little different, not much, though they're pretty, some of them don't have them, like foundations harvest orange, the, the 016 does not have a match in stroke and coat. Um, of course, you could always try to mix that too, but. So you can see all these here. 
Some are a little different, like the grape in the foundations and the grape in the stroking coat. But for the most part, they're pretty close. I really like foundations for a base coat. It's so smooth and dries much more quickly. Yeah, when we first started out with foundations, um, there was a direct match, but such as the red, it was the same as hot tamale. And then as we added more and more on foundations, they we got their own special. Okay, I wanted to show you this, this color wheel. So stroke and coat is intermixable. We can send this to you in our email also. I'm trying to start a, a list already, Krista. So like the foundations that you just did, the uh, wheel. So if you wanted to do color theory, or if you wanted to do a class or a workshop, or even in your own work, I like looking at this wheel sometimes just to see what colors I would like to put together. So you have all the secondary, primary, and the tertiary colors that will work together in with stroke and coats. It's just great how it works together. Now, the key though I have found is make sure you write down what your um, ratio is, how much, like if it's a teaspoon or a tablespoon of each color, because if you're like me, I sit down and I just start doing it and I don't write it down and then I go to mix another batch and it's not exactly the same. So then I have to blend those. So make sure that you uh, keep track of how much that you are. All right, so you can do one coat, two coats or three coats. So one coat is always going to be somewhat translucent, kind of watercolorish. Allow it to dry. Second coat is going to be semi-opaque. And the third coat is totally opaque. And I always recommend, and those of you that have been doing this longer than me, know that if you do everything in three coats, it's gonna look really flat. You're gonna want some things that are one coat, two coats to give de design and dimension to your projects. I agree, Teddy. When I had my studio, you know, people would ask how many coats and I really like the depth and the more hand painted look that you get when you do just one or two coats, depending on what you're doing. And one thing I really loved having is I had a wall that had had like wood strips and I had Velcro on the back of each tile. And on my tiles, I showed one, two and three coats of every color. Now, a lot of people already do that. But the great thing about mine is I had it up on Velcro so people could pull it down and then they could compare colors together like this would look good with this. And it was so much better to me than a tiny chip. I could really see the colors better, you know, painted in my studio, how they're gonna look. It was a good tool. I agree. Yeah, I like pulling it down and doing that. All right, so while we're waiting for this to dry, if you guys haven't already done this, go ahead and get your two pieces of paper. You can trim this off a little bit so that you can get it to match up a little bit better and tape your piece so you have it all in the order that we need it to lay it out. So you'll notice that we basically have kind of a straight line right here, the way it's laid out we have here, so that it, it's almost in a grid. It will stick to, it'll stick to it a lot better. So the stroking coat is going to stay glossy, it's gonna be vibrant, and you're going to have the shine. You can see the shine on this turtle on here. I think this is a really cute little turtle box. I wish I could say I made it, but I didn't. Um, and again, this is a box, so it's not food grade. So if we leave the bottom of this not glazed, so there'll be outgassing, so you don't get the little gas bubbles, that will be fine. You could get away with a one-time firing but I do like to let my clay dry as much as possible. Did you have any thing that you did with yours, Krista? With clay? Yeah. No, most of my clay I bisque fire just for ease in my studio for the classes that I did. But I do like putting it on greenware. Saves a step, especially. Yeah, I do too. Um, Oh, shelf life. Somebody is asking the shelf life of stroking coats. Sorry. You know, that's a good question and it's kind of hard to answer. I found a jar that had fallen off a shelf 
in my garage and it was like seven years old it was definitely thicker because even you wouldn't think so but plastic still breathes air is still going to get in there if it is just like thick swampy you can drop some water in there and distilled is preferred but you know if i don't have it i'll just do a few drops of tap water shake it up mix it up really good if it is rock hard it's not worth trying to reconstitute at all okay so it will last quite a while several years uh this bottle here is from um 2019 here's the lots on it so it says 19 and uh, which was the year and then the rest of it, I never remember. If you're interested in that, it is on Mako's website under resources, how to read the lot, because it'll tell you what week of what month and the year. I always just look at the first two digits. Oh, Marlene is asking, can, if we're doing multiple coats of white, can we add food coloring? Yes. Uh, the late, great John Dean, my on the road hubby, he did, had a great idea on that by adding food coloring again like if you're working with the three-year-olds or even ourselves because sometimes you can't tell where you put this on here john would say okay get three little pots uh so that you're going to get three coats on so we would take three of these we would put the white glaze in it and then this one, I would put the little blue food coloring. This one, I'd put a little red food coloring. And this one, I would leave white. And then he would tell the kids, okay, you know, mix it up good. Now, paint your whole plate blue. And then when that dried, he's like, okay, take your pink or red, whatever it is, and cover the blue with it. Oh, good job. Now, take the white and paint over and make sure all the blue or the red is covered. So it's really white because food coloring is going to burn off but it's a great visual aid for various coats to know whether you got the three coats on. And another reason I like that is if you're doing a class or a workshop, if this whole thing is encapsulated, covered completely with glaze, it goes right into the kiln. You just saved a full day of letting it dry, clear glazing, drying, and then going into the kiln. So there's some time savings. The less you touch this bisque, the more it increases your profit because you're not touching it over and over. I think at one point when I had my paint your own pottery studio, I figured we touched that piece about 17 times before it went out the door. When you figure, you know, you're unpacking it, put, you know, wiping it down, put it in on the shelf, helping the customer, clear glazing it, putting it in the kiln, taking it out of the kiln, dremeling it. It is just amazing how many times you actually touch that piece. All right, Mako is the first glaze manufacturer to really come out with a true beautiful red. For those of you that have been in this industry a long time, our reds were kind of a muddy brownish, not very pretty. Uh, our current chemical engineer, Steve Cutney, joined the company in the first month came out with this gorgeous, gorgeous red. And what's beautiful is you can take this red like hot tamale up to uh, cone six, even a 10, and it's going to stay red and vibrant and beautiful. Another plus is that red actually costs a lot more to manufacture but our prices are all even they're all the same so we may make less margin on red but it's made up with the margins on the rest of ours so we have an even palette of colors on the pricing so we have like candy apple red hot tamale tuscan red and if you guys have not tried ruby slippers oh it's one of the most spectacular blue reds I, I need to put a little tile together that shows you 73, 74 and uh, Ruby slippers together. I think it's 87 because they're gorgeous. And you can see that we have the green in here. It used to be that if you had green and red next to each other, you would get some cross bleed. That doesn't happen with stroke and coat. Gorgeous. All right. How's it? Oh, mine is still too damp to try to trace. So I'm gonna wait just a little bit longer, a little bit more show and tell because if my color comes up on my finger, I know that I'm still too wet, wet to go. Hey, so, Teddy, yeah. Sorry, I know this is stroke and coat, but does that happen with foundation if you put a red and a green together? 
No cross bleed, still looks perfect. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, Karen, stroke and cut will stick to your shelves. So we need to stilt these because it has frit in it. It has that glass. So, so this whole stroke and coat line is a true glaze. So when we paint the back of these, as a matter of fact, you're going to see my little bitty stilt marks probably because I need to get them clean and sharper. We stilt everything. Teddy, will you show the, the template tape together again, please? I will. All right, so I've got my cut line, my tape line, and I put it like that so that my little line, this comes across pretty even. Does that help? I think so. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Okay, so this is Mako's wonderful new website, which we all love. And when you come here, if you go to color, there's different ways to get around any website. You know, you can go to the top navigation, you can scroll down and get to the same things. Um, ooh, events, look at that, that's exciting. Um, so what we're gonna do today is go to color and I'm gonna go down here to stroke and coat. And just below it, you'll see the speckle stroking coat too. So I'm gonna to click on that. My little bar of people is there. Okay, here we go. So on here, you'll see um, a little blurb about stroking coat and then there's information further down. But one thing that I did not notice when we first brought out this website is these are two little bars. I just thought that was a little, you know, just some lines. Well, if you click on it, like product details here, this is dark, this is darkened right here. You can see all about it, where to buy it, uh, the brochure for stroke and coat, the safety data sheet, basics for use. You can click here and get even more information. This has information about food safety, dinnerware safety, how it comes. And then some of the things that Teddy has been talking to you about, about combining um, the reds on greenware. So all sorts of information is in here about the product itself. And then down at the bottom, you'll have helpful tips about it, frequently asked questions. You can click on these and get answers. This is really a great resource. But the other thing I wanted to show you when you scroll back up, this little bar here, if you're clicking on color swatches, see this bar becomes dark and gets bigger. And you can see all the stroke and coats. So on here, you'll see them fired to cone 06, and six. And as Teddy mentioned earlier, if you look on any jar bottle of the Mako product, it will say mid-range results, which means we're talking about cone six is mid-range. Um, and that will tell you if it doesn't change, if it darkens lightly, um, if it is um, lighter, whatever happens, you can see that there. Um, and that way also in our color guide, if you have a printed copy, and if not there, you can um, look on the website to see that one everything is listed as how it's affected at mid-range. But if you don't want to see all the cone six because you're working on low fire, you just go up here to select and you choose if you want cone six or 06. So now you can see the stroke and coat palette just at cone 06. And you can scroll all the way down, see all the colors, they're grouped by color. Love it this way. And then that's it. I really like that because it's visual, whereas before we would say, oh, you know, we would describe it with words and that doesn't mean that we're all going to visualize it the same. So I thought that was really cool, especially being able to do the 06 with the 6. Yeah, I love that. Of Kelsey and crew. So when you come to our project gallery here, click on that. It doesn't have a drop down, so you just click on that. So you can scroll down. My, my computer's moving a little slowly today. You can sort, oops, I didn't mean to click on that. Stop. Oh, stay right there because it shows the stroke and coat bird with oh, the yeah. flip. Yeah. Sorry, it went away. My computer did not think in time. Let me go back. Because this is the alternate plate that uh, your directions 
will show you with these colors. Okay, so I will show you that. You can sort here by the name of it, the oldest one that was on, put on, the newest. You can also see how many you want to see per page. I usually do view all because that way I can just keep on going. Um, you can search by earthenware bisque. If you only want to see low fire products, you can just click on earthenware bisque. And that will show you all different, different items with earthenware. Same thing for mid range. Um, low fire would encompass more than just the earthenware bisque shapes that we carry. Um, so you have different options there, clay, application techniques. And then here is the other project that Teddy was just showing. We're just talking about the different colors. So I love the way this one looks too. And these directions are in um, on the technique sheet we will send you tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so uh, somebody's asking, what's the difference between the cone six? So you have, this is zero six, which is about 1829. That's considered low fire. If you go to stoneware, this is, I've got water in here, so I can't tilt it too much. This is considered mid-range firing. This will be a six, which is gonna take you up to, oh, it's 19 something. It's not as maybe about a 400 degree difference, you wouldn't think that's a big deal, but if you fire this earthenware plate to a six versus a zero six, it will melt onto your kiln shelves and you will lose that load. So, happened to me. This darn thing. Okay. So, you definitely want to see, you know, when you're lo loading your kiln, if you're a six or a zero six, is stroke and coat comes in three different sizes, the two ounce, eight ounce, 16, and we have an assortment of gallons that really comes in handy, the red and the green during the holidays. <laughs> that comes in very handy. And you can check with your supplier on the pricing on all of those. But what's nice is these three, the eight, 16, and two ounce, all have the same opening so if you are using some of our little caps on them and tips, they all are the same size. All right. Now, I don't know if you guys are ready. Mine is still a little damp. So there's a way around getting around doing this. My tape came apart without the clay carbon paper. The clay carbon paper, you see this little strip here, it's because only one side transfers. And I'm going to show you right now. With the glaze still wet, if I try to work this, oh, all I did is gouged into it. Ooh, a little too hard. It doesn't typically transfer my pattern on. So what I will do is if I just lay down my pattern and I want to try to lay it out like there. So I laid it across so that I have the two birds right here, similar to this one. So you can see I've got the speckled one and then the green one. So it's kind of a little diagonal. When my glaze is damp like this, I can use a pin and press. Oh my God, my glaze is so wet and it's going to leave a mark, okay? If yours is too wet, you might want to wait a little bit longer. I'm going to just do this to demonstrate what we're doing, okay? And not press quite as hard. So when it's still damp, it'll leave a line. And then also what you can do after you do that is you can take a um, water-based marker. I like those better than Sharpies. And you can trace over that so that you can see your lines. All right, I said water-based and I'm using a Sharpie only because I can find it. So what I can do then is if I needed to, I could just mark my lines with the water-based, okay? I'm giving you guys options. I just don't want you to have to sit around forever waiting for glaze to dry. So I'm gonna get my pattern on here. 
If you have a fan, hopefully yours is a little drier than mine right now. I did not set up a fan yet because I'm running out of plugins in this spot. Okay, so by lightly pressing, I'm getting a nice little line in here that I can see. And if you'll notice, we did not outline the birds for a couple of reasons. I just like them being cute and sharp just by themselves. And also, if you're going to be teaching this or if you have customers that are going to be replicating, outlining is a skill. It takes time to get that down and everybody's going to have their own technique. If you've taken sessions from me before, you know that mine is loosey goosey and sloppy. I am not a precise glazer. Just can't do it, want to, try to, just never happens. Oh, this is why you tape your pattern. Mamacita, there. All right, so do what you can to get your pattern on. Make sure you breathe as you're doing this. Okay, and the directions, it said uh, two copies on the pattern. How many of you were like me where you printed it out twice thinking you would need to use it twice? What it meant was there was two pages. It took me about four times when I went, oh, I didn't have to print that that many times. Just goes to show you we all think a little differently. Now, typically I like to use a red or a colored ink pen to do this because then I can see where I have, I have already traced. I agree, Marlene, uh, avoid black Sharpies. Sharpies don't always fire out. Now I've had people say um, that they don't have problem with it. I have in the past where it didn't burn out or it leaves a little residue and it uh, repelled my glaze. Ah, good, here's my cheap, this is what I like, just cheap water-based marker. I'll use that now that I figured out where I put it. Okay, I'm gonna get my continue with my pattern and then I'll probably just go back and mark it on there. So tips and tricks, I agree. Sharpies concern me a little bit. Now, having said that, we've also had our in-house artists design some stuff using Sharpies and it worked, but I have also had it not work. I like the cheap water-based markers that you can get at the dollar store because they are definitely going to burn off. It's just a dye in there, kind of like use, using food coloring, same type of effect. All right. Okay, so I've got my pattern on there. And now, just to kind of reiterate, I'm going to, and you don't have to do this part. My, my glaze is uber wet though, because I did not have a little fan on it. So water-based marker is always good, just so you can see your design. Um, you know, I don't know if you could use a, a Sharpie kind of like a waxed resist just because of the fact that I have seen it burn off and I have seen it not burn off. Man, I think I'm making a mess of this. Good thing it does burn off because I'm not making this very pretty. So I don't think there'd be as consistent. Yeah, and I'm just doing this with the water-based marker just so you guys can see my outlines a little bit better. You don't have to do this. Um, but if you're working with somebody that is having difficulty seeing the lines or the pattern traced on, 
This is just a nice little tip and trick that a water-based marker will burn off. And this shows up a lot better on the camera for y'all. Yes, I'm a giver. This is for you guys, only for you. Don't judge me on my lines. Yeah, the tissue paper also works. Uh, Ronald is saying that you can use tissue paper. You can transfer your design onto tissue paper, then use your marker to go over it. I tend to either use clay carbon paper, mainly because Mako sells it, and or if my glaze is too wet like this. Okay. And if you want to keep your pattern close by, we put the colors that we're using on it. And when I say dark, that's because those are the ones that we're going to tint it with or shade it with black. Okay, so the S27, that'll be sour apple by itself. This is one that's darker, so, but let's work with our colors straight out of the bottle first. But if you want to keep an eye, I'm going to move this so you can see it a little bit better. I'll keep this plate right here so you can see the colors. Keep your pattern by so that you can also kind of tell which colors. It gets a little confusing sometimes when you just have all these funky little lines going on here. But see how you've got like the straight line across here? You've really got some little grids going, which I think is kind of fun. All right, so you're gonna get a palette out for your colors, for your glazes right here. I'm going to prime all my brushes, get everything wetty, ready. I'm going to get them wet, pull the water out, and it's ready to roll. So I have a couple of three different brushes. In almost all of our seminars, we use the script liner because it has such long bristles. You can get nice long strokes on that. Some of you, if you've not worked them, are probably more of a fan of the round filler. This is the number eight round. These are both of Mako's uh, brush lines. This is the CB with the wooden handle. This is the reflection brushes, RBs, and the acrylic. I personally like the acrylics the best because that way they don't get the chipped off, soaked wooden brushes. So, I, and then the tin outliner. So I've got all of those ready. Let's get our glaze out. We're gonna want some of the speckled stroke and coat the sour apple and the sun kissed. So I'm gonna put those out onto my palette. Okay, so I have my pattern kind of like this. So this one's gonna be my SC six, which is stroke and coat, I mean, um, sun kissed. So you can decide which brush that you want to use. Is a round filler better for you? Or do you like to get the script liner? Because I mean, look how much difference on the glaze. I'm just going to show you. If you're your script liner girl, which I kind of am, what's nice is you can get a nice long brush stroke and then I can just kind of smooth that out. If that's not your jam because you've really never used it much before, you can also use the round filler and fill in your bird. And I'm going with the shape of it. The directions say three coats because these are all nice and solid. Now I'm going to give you a caveat on that. If you are a heavy glazer and you can get it done in two, I'm going to say go with two. When I work with the general public or people that have not done very much with 
ceramics, I'm always going to say three coats because I want it nice and solid. So look at your pattern. And we're going to do all of the light stroke and coat first. So let my pattern out or look at your own pattern. So this one. This little birdie right here. I'm going to do all three coats of these first. Uh, one is because I'm lazy, or maybe it can be considered smart, is because that way I'm not having to clean my brush over and over. And typically by the time I go all the way around on the second and third, yeah, I can get all three coats done at the same time. If you get the colors off, it's probably going to be okay. We just want to have them random. Now this one, it doesn't look like I put dark on there, but according to this, it is dark, so. Eh. I laid this out just a little bit different than last time. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. It's because been a request for you to do your hump day song. <laughs> what? Okay, so we're doing two to three coats, depending on if you're a heavy glazer or a lighter glazer. We're doing all the light ones first. Then we're gonna come back and for example, well, wait, we're not ready yet. All right. So we want nice, vibrant little birdies. Long flowing coats. I'm always going to say long flowing coats. No short little choppy ones. More is more. Fill that brush up. I tend to flip my brush over also when I, um, you know, fully load it. One side is really full of glazed. Flip it over and use the glaze on the back side. So getting my two to three coats, depending on how heavy. Typically, the smaller the area, the less coats I put because you can really, you know, fill in a small area with one good heavy coat, but these are decent sized. If you're waiting for those to dry, you can rinse out your brush and go on to the other colors. So for me. This one, this one, and this one. If you want to also, oh, my hand is cramping. You know, I could have brought the color down to the beak and then put black over it. The black would have covered it. But since I have a nice little line that shows the differences, I'm just going to paint the black directly on the plate. One thing that I haven't talked about also is you can do light over dark with stroke and coat as well. Um, that is one thing that I really, really liked about it. And one of the reasons I started using stroke and coat a long time ago is the fact that I could put a light color over a darker color. And, you know, my information is, I mean, my background was in the paint your own pottery. So at Halloween, what we would do is that we would paint the background black and then we would take a uh, cottontail white and paint a baby's foot and press it down with the toes down and make it a little ghosty. And because it is one coat, it was a translucent, but you could see the white over the black. 
So I like the fact that, you know, I can do the light over the dark and I can paint around, I don't have to paint around it to get it to work. That was big for me because not everybody can get a nice solid background with their applications. You get a lot of ridges and bumps and lumps when you have to paint around things. So I really like that feature of strip and coat. Well, I hope you can't hear that. There's a message going on the house phone. Now on the edge here, I got a little sloppy, so I'm going to clean that up a little bit. Um, you know, I could clean it up a little bit more if when we come and bring my black rim up a little bit, but you can just wipe that off with the damp sponge. That's one thing I like about ceramics is nothing is permanent until it's fired. You can change anything anytime until you fire it. Even after it's fired, a lot of times you can come back in. One, that's another reason why I kind of like not using clear glaze on my product because when you put clear glaze on it and then you come back and go, oh, oh I got outside the line. Um, Let's say I didn't get this coverage very well. With no clear glaze on it, I can come back and I can put strip and coat over this, deepen it up, clean it up a little bit and refire it. With clear glaze, it seems like if you put a strip and coat or a foundations or something over it again, you get a little bit of a fisheye effect. It, it moves a little bit. So that's just one of my little things that I like. Okay. When do you choose to use clear glaze? Um, usually if I have, um, if I'm doing a watercolor or a thin or, hey, Krista, can you spotlight me? Somebody's saying they can't see what I'm doing. Um, I thought it was, but just in case. So, or if I know that my glaze is uneven or if there's even a question on whether I have it on there good enough to keep it um, um, dinnerware safe. I couldn't get my words. Thank you. Can you guys see what I'm doing now? So going back to the clear glaze, if, if yes. you put clear glaze on things, it does make it din uh, dinner safe, dinnerware safe. Yeah. Anytime you encapsulate this bisque with uh, foundations, stroke and coat, clear glaze, it's all dinnerware safe because there's no surface textures. So this plate has no clear glaze on it. It is still dinnerware safe. Okay, because it's um, a fritted glaze. It's completely encapsulated. There's nothing to trap bacteria. So it's good to go. So I clear glaze only when I think that uh, I don't have it completely encapsulated with three coats. If I was just doing a one coat, a watercolor, or if somebody is a really light glazer and they really don't have this covered, or if we had just painted this design directly on the bisque with no base coat, then I would be clear glazing for sure. Or if you use something other than stroke and coat? Um, foundations, you, you can skip the clear glaze. Let me okay. try. Elements, you don't clear glaze anyway because it is also a glaze and um, it'll change the color. So it's really, I think, um, more of a technique or, or is the bisque fully encapsulated, I think is what you're going to really ask yourself. You know, uh, the paint your own pottery industry, since we have a lot of walk-in customers, uh, you never know if they really base coated it with properly. Okay. Or a lot of times people will do all this beautiful work on the front and absolutely nothing on the back. Well, then I would, I would clear glaze it. So you just want to make sure that the glaze, uh, the bisque is encapsulated. If it's not, then clear glaze. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. All right, so I'm moving on to my green now. I still need to go back and put my third coat on my yellow birds. 
What did I do? Oh, I didn't clean my brush. I'm going to just answer this instead of typing it. Um, someone's asking if you should brush the clear or spray it. You can brush it. Um, I, I'm a dipper, but if you brush it, you just want to make sure you don't keep going back and forth and back and forth and reconstituting that glaze and making it smear. So you can do it either way. Yeah, and on the spraying, if you look at Mako's website, we really don't recommend a lot of spraying um, because you have to have the proper protective, what is it, PPE, proper, proper protective equipment and a respirator. So you'll see that we have a lot of uh, hesitancy on recommending spraying. Another question, if you're doing it on greenware, you're waiting for it to dry after you bisque fire it, yeah, then you can put a clear glaze on it and then then fire it and make it food safe. Yippers. Now for dishwasher safe, we say with earthenware shapes, they're really better to be hand washed. I mean, I do put mine in the dishwasher. Best practice is to hand wash it, but it's really because of the clay body, not so much the glaze itself. All right. Yeah, and since you're, go you're dishwasher safe, you do uh, stoneware. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Earthenware is just so porous that it's going to absorb moisture. Okay, I'm, I'm doing what I tell you guys not to do. I'm fiddling too much with my glaze. I'm going to let that dry a little bit more. It always amazes me that people will spend hours painting it and then they say, can we put it in the dishwasher? And you think, well, would you do that with a piece of artwork, stick it in the dishwasher? It always amazes me that, always. Yeah. Okay, I need to come back and do more coats on here. So since I'm not sure where everybody is on this process, I'm just going to show you how we get our darker um, birds. All right, so I'm going to take a little bit of black and I'm just going to put like a drop to begin with into my yellow and mix it up so it's a little bit deeper. You decide how dark you want it. I don't really want mine black looking. I just want a darker yellow. Now you could use, we're using Sunkist, you could have gone to a nether yellow, which of course now I'm, my mind is going blank, a deeper yellow and used it. Like but, dandelion or... Thank you. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get the word out. Dandelion. Wow, I put too much black. But that's not that's a bad color. lesson in what happens when you put too much black. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. This takes a drop. Yeah. All right. So it's mixed it up pretty good. It almost looks a little greenish to me, but you mix it up to the color that you like. And all I'm doing is I'm putting my dots here so I know where I'm doing my darker birds. Oh, I like that idea, doing the dots. That's, that's pretty smart. I got a, got a little confused on what I'm doing, so I might have to change up my... Well, there's no wrong way. You're learning the technique either way, right? Exactly. So I'm going to do... Yeah, we'll just do this one. Whatever. Okay. So I just deepened it, or what we called uh, shading, made it a little bit darker and I'll add three coats on. So that'll have a little contrast compared to the bird that is just straight sun kiss right next to it. Okay, so then we'll do the same thing. I think this time I'm just gonna put my black to the side and add some color to it. Man, it's not a lot of black. You guys can see, I'm just putting a little bitty dollop down there not very much. And then this time, I think I'm going to add my green to the black. Oh, it's so dark. No, I don't like it that dark, so I'm going to add more green, which is what you guys can do. It's kind of a learning process. Oh, that's better. If you're working with kids, you can even literally say drops, you know, because stroking is that nice little tiny spout, but you can just actually do a drop and a drop. Exactly. So I'm just going to do two darker green birds, and if I have to come back and add. 
sometimes I find it's easier to take just a little bit of the black and put it in the color instead of the color into the black. I don't know. Yeah. If that might be helpful. That's what I did the first time and I wasn't quite sure. I, I think, and then when I painted this other plate, that's what I did. Um, I think I just still put a little bit. That's kind of a nice color. It's almost like our uh, green thumb without. I don't feel like I'm glazing good today. Do you guys have days like that where you know you're just some days that touch is just on the money and then other days it's like I, I should just go do something else. Definitely. Especially outlining, you know, some days you have really shaky hands. All right, so you can see I'm getting some definition between my little birdies. Quit playing with it, let it dry. All right, I'm gonna add a little bit of black into my blue. I'm gonna try it this way, a little less black. And this blue is speckled. It has little bitty white frit, little chunks of white that adds to it. So it adds a little pop of color to your design with no extra work. So speckles are kind of fun to use interspersed in your work or even by themselves. All right, so you can see that's a little bit deeper. I like that better instead of dropping it directly into the glaze, picking up a little and adding an, a little along the way. So you guys saw the different ways I did it. I find I like that the best. I really right. like that you're mixing the speckles because a lot of times I don't think about tinting or shading with a speckle. I ended up using it the, you know, just as is, but this is a great way to show using it multiple ways. Yeah, I wish I thought of it. Elizabeth is the one that came up with that idea. <laughs> I think it was her. No, no, it was me. Of course it was me. Kidding. This is kind of an example as my glaze is still fairly damp. Uh, the undercoat, the cotton tail. So that's why it's not laying down as well as if it was going on dry bisque. The same type of effect happens when you're working on wet clay. The drier it is, the better it grabs. The wetter it is, it doesn't seem to grab hold as well. All right, so I've got all my birds on there. Going to add more coats to it in a little bit. I'm going to let you guys keep working. Oh, look at that big old blot of color. Now, what I like to do whenever I do that is I just like to lift it off. When you have a background color like the stroke and coat we put on here, you can easily lift your color off, especially I would do this when. Um, black. I never like to take a damp sponge or cloth or anything and try to lift uh, wipe off black. It just seems like it pushes it deeper into the project and it smears. So I really like trying to lift it off of the background and then if I need to I can take a paper towel or a sponge or whatever is your favorite and just lightly wipe it off. If I had gone too deep and gouged into the background color, I could have easily just reapplied a little bit more stroke and coat. When I had my shop, I always wore an apron and I kept an X-Acto knife in my pocket. Uh, one, I could cut you, so don't make me mad. Or two, I could lift off the glaze of these little spots like I've done several times on here. Okay. Also, if you have a brush that has one of the a beveled edge, it helps too. Which, yeah. 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 Edge. But you can't yeah. really see it on my screen. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, I don't know why I, I like the exacto. I think mainly because it was just nice and sharp and I could really get under there and lift it. But, you know, everybody kind of figures out what works them for me. Yeah, this is the beveled edge brush right here. That helps lift off also. Okay, now my glaze is going on a little bit better. So when you get to the blue, you're gonna see little chunks in there. Don't think something's wrong with it. It's supposed to be there to give you those little white pop of color. We'll send you the picture and the link for the other project that uses orange and some yellows and just to give you some color options. I always like options on projects because invariably I would hold a workshop or a class and somebody's like, oh, I don't like those colors. Can I do something different? Like, no, you're going to do it this way and you're going to like it. If you have any questions, unmute yourself and let us know, or you can do it on chat either way. One thing I wanted to talk about, we said we would teach you how to roll glaze. So let's say you have a vase or you wanna do the inside of a mug or a vase and you don't think that you can get your brush strokes down in there. If you take a little pot and you put stroke and coat, whatever color you want, it doesn't matter. And a little bit of water. So I do three parts glaze and one part water. So if you use a measuring spoon or if you just eyeball it and you put about that much glaze in there, you just add a little bit more water. You know, maybe even just a cap full of water. Mix it all together. And then what you can do is you can pour it into your vessel, swirl it around, and then you keep swirling it around until it comes up to the top. If you need to, you can take your soft fan brush and fan out the rest. And then any excess, just pour it back into the original cup and then leave this item upside down. You wanna keep it inverted so that that glaze doesn't go back into the bottom and then you get a huge pooling down in the bottom of it. Because when you get too much glaze, sometimes it'll crawl and, and expose the bisque. So that's a good way of getting good coverage in there. And because you're rolling and kind of taking your time, it's absorbing into that bisque and you get a nice coverage. That's really good for all those funky necked vases that you just are not going to get your brush in there. So it's three parts glaze, one part water, and don't mix up a huge batch of it because what will happen is the solids will settle out over a period of time and the glaze separates. So you only wanna mix enough of what you're going to do for that project and then roll glaze with it. Now, this plate I think is cute because we're using a lot of different colors, but you could do monochromatic very easily using various shades of blues or pinks or yellows and just doing all the same color, but various intensities and shading on it. There's so many different ways that you could do this. On the one that has an orange, actually Elizabeth, the designer of this particular project, she did a little bit of watercolor of the orange around the plate to give it a little bit of pop and color to it.
we did a project in art class in college that was you only had a few colors kind of like this and you would just mix and mix and mix to make your design and it was so much fun it's a good way to get to use less colors like if you're doing an event to go or something yeah to just take less stuff and then people have fun mixing and creating their own colors Stroke and coat is just a, a wonderful, wonderful glaze. I put too much dark in here, so I'm going to bring in some of my yellow because it, it looks green to me instead of yellow. The other thing is that it's so great. I mean, you've mentioned this, but that you can kind of tell what the colors are going to look like when it's fired too. I mean, we can tell because we've seen it so often, but even your customers or your students or whoever you're working with are going to have a better idea of what it's going to look like, which is good when you're mixing and blending and all that. You remember back in the day when Moody Blue was like this really bright, it almost looked acrylic. It was so, such a funky blue. Now it really looks a lot closer to what it's gonna look like when it's fired. Teddy, talking about using the ratio you would use for foundations to roll the glaze. Same thing, three to one. It's just a good a standard ratio, three parts glaze, one part water. And don't ever pour it back into your your full jar. You know, Teddy well, said small yeah. batches are smart. Just if you have, if you're going to keep that for another vase or something, put it in that separate container, then use it again. You know, but shake it up, of course. Definitely. Just yeah, they just the settle thing. out and pancake after a period of time. You know, all the solids, the heavies, just separate out from the base. Yeah, I tend to use foundations more for that because it's. Um, not as thick to begin with, but what if they, we don't have a foundation color you want, you can use stroke and coat. Stroke and coat is the wonder glaze. It does it all. And I haven't said this, but it is non-toxic. So it's perfect for working with uh, children of any age. You know, if you're doing hand prints or something and the kid sticks his hand in his mouth with glaze on, it's not a big deal, not a big deal. I don't know about you, but I think my plate is cute. I'm such an only child. All right. So again, because I don't know where you guys are exactly in the process. If you want to look at me for a minute, I'm going to explain the next step because I want to make sure you guys are, you know, have the information and can work at your own pace. Nothing worse than having to just sit there and wait and wait and wait for the next information. So I'm going to get the pattern. One, I'm going to get my paper towel. Want that little wingy dingy pattern. Okay. So if you want to, if you're going to cut out several of them, the direction says to cut out about 12 of these. I didn't do it that way. So you can follow the directions or you can try it kind of like what I'm doing. All right. If you guys don't have a really good pair of scissors, I highly recommend it. I got these at Joann's. They're from Italy, Hanford. Oh my gosh, I got rid of all my cheap scissors because that's amazing the difference. So I'm going to cut out and because I folded my paper several times, this is going to give me several little wings at one, with one cut. All right. That's efficiency because I am lazy. But cutting it on the outside of the line, giving me some little wings. And you know what, if you guys don't want to do that, you can probably just cut, you know, draw your own. It's not that difficult. But not everybody's comfortable with hand drawing and sketching and stuff. So now I've got all these little wings, right? I'm going to draw it onto my paper towel. And like I said, I really like my paper towel because it has all this texture. See the texture in that? Which when I stamp it onto my plate, it adds that texture and gives me an, another little design element with no extra work, which, so I thought that was fun. So I'm just gonna draw a couple of these.
And you know, whenever we design something, sometimes people go, well, why did you do it that way? Well, you know, it's kind of artist choice. Everybody gets to the finish line just a little bit differently. It doesn't mean one's better or more right than the other, or if there is only one way, we'll tell you. But on this, I read it and I'm like, eh, that just sounds like too much work for me. Again, I told you I'm lazy. So what I did is I used the same thing over and over. So what we're going to do is we're gonna take our deepened colors and we're going to basically paint the little wing and then we press it down. So that's how we get this little design here. So we get the extra texture from the pattern, from the uh, paper towel. We're going to deepen it just a little bit. You could, if you wanted to, just paint that with thinned out one coat, stroke and coat. Not a problem. This is just a fun little extra way. Another learning opportunity, if you will. Okay, so I'm going to cut this out. And the directions say to use a sponge on a stick. I'll show you all the various ways because again, there's no 100% right way. All right, what an idiot. Why didn't I fold my paper and like I did before and just do one cut? Because I was talking and I couldn't do two things at one time. I found that I didn't need to cut a bunch, but I'm going to just for this session, just to make sure that we have what we want. So now I've got my little wingy dinghies. I've got some really cool texture to it. And I'm going to take the deepened color and apply it. So I could use a sponge. I could use a sponge on a stick. And you can also use your brush. So I'm just going to show you different ways. So let me take my darkened yellow and I'm just going to apply some of the glaze on here. I'm going to take this and lay it down. I might have to go a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to press it on here to transfer the glaze. So that's actually a screen printing. Can you see how I have just a little light design on there and a little bit of texture? So we'll come back after we stamp everything and then just do a little fun wing on there and finish off the black. So I used my sponge. I could also use my brush, which is what I did. And I just added a coat of glaze to this, being careful not to puddle it and get it too thick somewhere. So I, because I'm lazy, I use the same piece every time, but it worked, it didn't fall apart. If it starts falling apart, you're gonna wanna use a new piece. So I'm trans transferring it, my glaze. And then, you know, you can also use your sponge on a stick. You're going to use a dry sponge on a stick. Load it up. You don't want big blobs on there. Pounce it onto my paper towel. And then lay it down, transferring the glaze again. Just make sure you press it so that it makes good contact. And we have a little design and a little contrast. So I did all my yellow. I'm going to do green on that one just for giggles. Okay, that is how we get the little wing on there. So continue on in your process. I just want to make sure nobody's sitting there bored. You've got your three coats of the cottontail white as your background. We're going to summarize here. We transferred on our pattern. And see here, sometimes people get a little concerned. See how that uh, the magic, the marker started bleeding? It's not a big deal. It's going to go away. All right. So don't worry about that bleeding. Then we put three coats of the color, the glazes, straight out of the bottle. And then we 
shaded by adding just a drop of black to the same colors to give us a little variation. So we basically have six colors on here, but only use three glazes. Gotta love that. Now we're going to use a paper towel for the wing. Use the deepened color, transfer, I mean, paint your paper towel, press it down, transfer it onto your bird. Oops. And then we'll come back and do the finish with the blacks. Oh, that's a cute idea, Krista. She's a, Krista said it'd be cute for Christmas stockings, pumpkins, flowers. Yeah, you can take this same type of technique and just change it up. But so in this, we're showing you that you can base coat with Struck and Coat. You can des do design work. You can lighten it with white and tint it, or you can shade it and add black. You could also mix colors to come up with your own colors. Just watch your ratio. It is frit based, meaning that it has glass in it. And if you encapsulate, it is totally dinnerware safe. It is an approved product. You have the AP seal, which means it's an approved product that is not gonna harm children, small animals, or any of us. It is non-toxic, lead-free, and food safe. Food safe is a regulatory definition, meaning that in the fired state, it is not gonna leach out any minerals or any materials that will be harmful. You can use it on clay, you can use it on bisque, you can fire it 06 all the way up to a cone six. It is a, it just does it all. I've got my deepened green. I'm going to do all my little birdies now. You guys keep working, but you're welcome to just kind of check in and oh, see what I'm doing. Okay, this is why you have extra. It was a two ply paper towel and it came apart. Oops. My two part paper towel is coming apart now, so I'm having to use my palette knife to lift it off. Kind of be aware that may happen to you. I don't remember that happening last time I did it. Of course, I was probably having a cocktail when I was doing it, and everything is better when you're having a cocktail. All right, so I've got all my little wingy dings on here. So now's when I get to do all the little futsy stuff, which some people, this is their favorite. And again, just keep working at your pace. We're doing fine on time. So here's where I'm going to use a black. 
Now, because of the viscosity or the thickness of Mako's glazes, when I'm doing smaller areas or if I'm just going to do outlining, I thin it down a little bit with water on my brush. In this case, we're going to be basically filling in. So I do a drop and fill. See how much glaze is on my brush? When I have a little area like this, I like to take that literally kind of drop in my glaze and then I just move it around, all right? And I am done because it is so thick in such a small area that I don't need to go over it three times. So that is one way of doing it, a drop and fill. You could also just literally paint it brush stroke on this black. If you put it on a little generous, one time is sufficient. It is so heavily pigmented that that is going to work. And then for the eyes, I use the back of the brush, dip it in my glaze, and then just dot it on. Again, one time is more than enough. I'm gonna come back and do a nice generous coat on this little stubby legs. And then the wing, you guys can do the wings however you want. Uh, if you look at this one, got a little swipe and then kind of like there's a little feather on it. It again is only done one time. If you want to get a little fancier, you're welcome to do that. If you want to thin this down just a little, just so it pulls more, I add a little bit of water to my brush. I sneak, ah, sneak into the edges right here and kind of pull it out a little. And it just depends on, do you want a really thin, if you're gonna want a thin line? I stayed on the very tip of my brush. If I want to, so it's more perpendicular. If I want a thicker line, I'm gonna lay it down like a pencil. Real thin, see it's straight up and down. I wish I could get it on here better. So let's do it again. So it's more straight up and down, staying on the tip and I'm just kind of pedaling around. But if I want it thicker, so that is artist choice. It's totally up to you. Again, like outlining very thin, I don't think is very easy. So that's why I like having my paper here and I can do it, keeping it straight up and down. I'm using my little finger to hold my hand in place. And then I keep it just on the tip of the brush. You know, if you wanted to come back and add some little swipes to it, that's fine too because it's your project. So that's how we're going to finish this off on the little details. We're not going to stay on line to do the back of it. You guys are welcome to work on the back of it. Again, three coats of any color you want. The directions say black. Make sure that you come up and get your rim. Now, on the rim of this, we could have gone all the way over with three good coats of the white and then matte. What you don't want to do is three coats of white and then three coats of black over it. On these edges, when they're cleaned, it's not um, unheard of for them to be cleaned a little too good. And then if you get six coats or so on there, sometimes that will lead to shivering. Not always, but it can happen. That's very cute on a picture frame. I like the way they're going different directions and coming together. So this, this gives you a re This is a reduction of 15% off the pattern. Ooh, good tip. That's cute. And I broke the rules because I didn't do the wings the right way. I painted a third of the sponge and pressed that into the wing. See, that's what I mean. There's always different ways of accomplishing the project. I make you, I make you look very detailed. I'm even lazier. <laughs> no, I like that. That's a good idea. A third of that, you know, and it just kind of depends. We, we try to add a little something unique to these, these classes, you know, 
but yeah, why not do a portion of that and then just sponge it on? Those are very, very cute. That works good. It's a nice little sponge. Your outlining is, you know, a little avant-garde. It doesn't have to be perfect. And that's the way I, I like it. And as I like it to be loose and easy because I want people to feel like they can accomplish a good look. Hey, Ronald, were you going to say something about using stroke and code on uh, greenware? Yeah, if you fire it, make sure you don't cover up the un unglazed part. You know, if it's like the bottom of a vase, put it on a stilt anyway. So air can go underneath and get rid of those gases of the of the bisque or of the clay. You know, if you put a yeah. whole piece on the shelf, there's no way the gas is going to move out because the shelf is there. That's a good point. See, there's only so many tips and tricks, and that's the one nice thing about doing these videos is, I mean, we can share this stuff. Yeah, you know, that reminds me, um, because everybody has such different experiences and how you can learn from each other. On Facebook, if you guys aren't aware, there we just created, I guess, last week, last week or two, Mako Earthenware Society, and that is dedicated to everything low fire. So no matter if you are a production artist, a teacher, paint your own pottery studio, whatever, there's a place to share because we can all learn from each other. So we love to see what you're creating, ask questions, you know, whatever. Highlight a friend that's doing something really cool, but come join in on that conversation. It's really new, so we're getting it going. So we appreciate all of you tons. I hope you sign up and join us for the Designer Liner. It's a cool project and it's, it's, it's very relaxing. I and we will be posting more classes. Please join us for July. Thanks for coming, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.